I mean, first, let me just welcome the audience, including the web audience uh, and the radio audience, back, uh, back to the Global Philanthropy Forum, our 10th anniversary. Uh, I'm Jane Wales, and I'm lucky enough to uh, have a conversation in the next 45 minutes with Jeff Rakes. Uh, as all of you know, Jeff is the uh, CEO of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundations. Before joining the foundation, Jeff was at, of all companies, Microsoft, uh, and before that, Apple Computer. Um, and before joining the high-tech world, though, Jeff went to Stanford University, a very popular place here, um, who, and, and his idea was that he would uh, study in, to, to go into the world of agricultural policy yep. uh, in large measure because Jeff is from Nebraska and from a farming family. So uh, our conversations earlier today about uh, sustainable agriculture was something he could get deeply into. Um, so Bill Gates has obviously changed your life not once but twice. Um, <laughs> and, uh, it, but, but now you have a chance to think about farms again yes, uh, and sustainable agriculture. <laughs> so um, Jeff, your foundation is, is really known for being data driven, to be all about evidence uh, and uh, all about kind of getting it right, testing out ideas and getting it right. But what's the role of a heart in all this? And uh, who, who's got the role, who's got the job within the Bill and Melinda Gates leadership of injecting that aspect of the work? Well, uh, as, as you would, as your question suggests, the heart is extremely important. I think for, for everybody here in this, this audience involved in philanthropy, they're drawn by a passion, a passion for the work, a passion to change the world to make it better, a passion to, to help people. I know for me, the way in which I capture or focus in on that passion is to really think about the, the people who are served. You know, sometimes you use the term beneficiaries, but for me, it's really, it's David and Lucy, uh, dairy farmers in Okalao in uh, north, north, northern Kenya, or Vicki Pendergrass, a, uh, a principal I met in Washington, D.C., or Kombe, a smallholder coffee farmer that I met in Uganda, or Arshi, uh, a 21-year-old girl I met uh, last fall who contracted polio in Bihar, in India. So for me, the grounding in the work really comes from the opportunity to travel, See, uh, see the work that we're doing, but in particular, to really have that conversation, that dialogue with our aspiration to serve those who are in need. Mm -hmm. Now, we know that about eight million people, kids die before age five, and I recently heard Melinda Gates speaking, and what she said that, that um, I forgot what percentage of those die before 28 days. It's, it's about uh, uh, 40, 42 percent. That percentage has been coming up because with the miracle of vaccines, we're able to save a large number of, of children from diseases like diarrhea and pneumonia. And uh, uh, so now what's happening is, is that first 28 days, neonatal mortality has not been decreasing as rapidly as the, the period of, say, one to five years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what, is it, what does it take? You, you all are focused very much on innovation. Mm -hmm. So tell me how you, how you approach that, how you think about innovation within the, the context of the foundation. Well, as, you're, uh, as you suggested earlier, we're very much drawn to the data and the evidence. And so um, in, in for that population that we think is extremely important, the 8 million children who die each year under the age of five, and then the 3.6 million who, who die in the first um, uh, you know, 28 days of their lives, 66% or two-thirds of them die of, of, of low birth weight, uh, birth asphyxia, or sepsis, severe, severe infections. And so what you try and do is you try and learn uh, more about what are those types of innovative interventions that would give the uh, uh, whether it's a midwife or whether it's a, a, a primary health care worker, uh, the family, the opportunity to prevent, um, uh, prevent those deaths. And how much is this is about new technology, you know, vaccines, et cetera, and how much about it is, is, is just sort of changed human behavior? That's a great question. Innovations come not just in uh, scientific and technological uh, or so-called high-tech uh, forms. They also call, come in low-tech forms. And although this is switching gears for a second to agricultural development, one of the things, one of the innovations I was very impressed with was some work that we uh, funded at Purdue University to create 
a triple layer bag for, for cow peas that dramatically reduces the loss, uh, which increases for a low tech innovation of a dollar or two, increases the income of the farmer on the range of 100 to 200 dollars on average per year. So I think it's extremely important that you look at high tech innovations, and in particular, those innovations typically mean you have to take things and you really get, uh, uh, get them at low cost. You have to look at low tech innovations. And the other thing that I think uh, we're learning a lot more about is you, have to, you also have to look at behavioral change, because a lot of times, like for example with neonatal mortality, a lot of, of success can come from behavioral mm -hmm. uh, change. The way in which the, uh, the mother cares for that newborn in the first, uh, you know, the first week, the first uh, four weeks. So when it comes back to, back to the sort of high tech world, what are the, um, the barriers to innovation? I mean, to what extent is it the, the cost of R&D? To what extent is just the sheer time it takes to get from, from that first idea, that first experiment, to getting something to market? Well, take, for example, the work that, that uh, has recently come to fruition, or at least a stage of fruition, with meningitis A uh, vaccine. Uh, there are approximately a half billion people in uh, uh, sub-Saharan Africa that live in the so-called Menj A uh, belt. That means this half, sorry, I think I said half a million, half billion, about almost 500 million uh, people. And, and meningi meningitis A is a, is a terrible infectious disease. If, if you're in a rural area, uh, you're not likely to get treatment within the 20, first 24 hours, and therefore you basically have a death sentence. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Gates Foundation helped to fund the development of a, of a vaccine that focuses in on the A serotype. Uh, that started back in 2001. And typically, what you've seen happen over the years is that that to the extent the vaccines were developed and then made available in the developing world, that was typically a 30-year process. And we just, uh, with the, the help of, of organizations like PATH, we were able to uh, get the meningitis A vaccine uh, developed uh, through trials and uh, into the market, if I can use that, that term or phrase, to the people who really need this vaccine. Uh, just this last year. So that 10 years is really uh, squeezing what would be the norm, but it takes a lot of, yeah. uh, it takes a lot of R&D uh, investment. It takes a lot of work with regulatory agencies. It takes a, a lot of work with organizations like Gavi. Uh, on vaccine initiatives in order to really make these things uh, now, happen. Gavi is Global Alliance for Vaccine Initiative, Do that, I have it right? That was my, what my understanding is that was originally uh, what the acronym was for, but now they just go by Gavi. So You're making uh, it know. easier but for the But it's about vaccines, let's say it that way. <laughs> so um, I, I'm glad you mentioned PATH because all of you know that tonight we're, we're sort of so proud that the Hilton Humanitarian Award will be, uh, Hilton Humanitarian Prize will be given tonight here. And uh, of course, PATH is a former awardee mm -hmm. of, uh, of the Hilton folks. Um, you know, we've been focused on turning points, and I think we're lucky enough, in large part because of the work that the Gates Foundation has done, to be facing some really positive turning points when it comes to specific disease eradication. Um, so say a word about the opportunities that you see out there. Well, the number one priority that we see is polio eradication. I mean, por polio is a horrible infectious disease uh, that I think is symbolic of, of something that, that's probably very interesting to this audience. You know, uh, 30, 40 years ago, uh, people grew up with the fear of, of polio, and in our country, of course, we don't think about uh, polio much anymore, but it uh, wasn't that long ago there where there were still, you know, millions of cases of, of polio every year, and, and, you know, in particular, that was in the developing world. That's where uh, people who are poor, who don't have the benefit that our kids have in the rich world, uh, they would be susceptible to that, that disease. There's been a 99% reduction in polio cases in, uh, in the last 20 years, but that means there's still 1% left. And, and it's extremely important that the world come together and eradicate polio. Now, why do I say that? Because what happens is with polio, if you don't you know, stomp it out, 
then it's a fire that will break out. And we'll go from where we are today, which is a, a, a couple of thousand cases, back up to 100,000 or more cases, and of course, all of the issues that come from that. Another great example of progress is with guinea worm uh, uh, eradication. I just had the opportunity, the pleasure really, to sit down with Ernesto of the Carter Center and talk about guinea worm eradication. And if you go back to 1986, there were about three and a half million cases of guinea worm. And um, since everybody just had their lunch, I'm not going to uh, <laughs> tell them uh, what it's like to, to be afflicted with guinea worm, but it has to do with big worms that burrow out of your body. And um, those worms then, uh, because it's just so incredibly painful, those worms, um, you, you, you know, the, the person will basically put their arm in water to try and reduce the pain, but that means the larvae from the, the worm infect the water, and so there's this ongoing cycle. Now here's an example of, of low-tech, mostly low-tech, not completely low-tech uh, innovation. It has to do with great public health programs to really ensure that people are drinking from a safe water supply. And so with the leadership of the uh, President uh, Carter and the Carter Center and a lot of support from a number of organizations, including the Gates Foundation, We've gone from three and a half million cases of guinea worm in 1986, now down to about 1,700 uh, mm. cases. And, and, and where are they? <laughs> and is that primarily in Sub-Saharan Africa? Primarily in Sub-Saharan uh, Africa. And, and the, I'm not gonna be able to list the five countries off the, the top of my head, but I do know where the biggest challenge challenges are at this point in time. Mm -hmm. I think they, they've gone from 20 countries down to, to five or six countries. But the real challenges have been in, for example, southern Sudan. Mm -hmm. And that just shows in these conflict regions, you do run into situations where basically you can't implement the, the, uh, uh, the programs that will be able to contain and eliminate uh, the, the, the um, in this case, the, the parasite. And so, uh, and it's, it's just, you know, I, I guess I should have pointed out, for, for us in the rich world, we don't think about these kinds of, of problems because they don't exist. These are the diseases of the poor um, uh, in, the, in the developing world. And, and so, you know, here's an example of something where if you get, if you get guinea worm, uh, you're going to be probably disabled for 90 days or more. So it reduces agricultural productivity. It means the mother can't take care of a, a, a child. She's got to find a surrogate mother to nurse the child. It means the kid can't go to school. Uh, so, you know, the, the thing is you can say, well, we went from 3.5 million cases down to 1,700 cases, but you lose sight of what that really means for those families, for those people, mm -hmm. to now be able to tend to their crops, have the agricultural productivity that is fundamental to their human existence, to be able to have their kids go to school, for that mother to be able to, to nurse that child. So those are the kinds of successes that I think we have to tell the stories of, and we have to do a better job of making people aware of what those opportunities are. And in that case, it's really about prevention. Mm -hmm. Isn't it about that rather than cure? You're trying to. That's correct. There is no uh, the key. The key thing. The 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 good news, if there is any, about guinea worm is that it's the reservoir is human. There's no animal-based reservoir. So essentially, if you eliminate the uh, if you control it so it, it doesn't get into the human body, then guinea worm, uh, the parasite, no longer mm -hmm. uh, exists. And so that's something that we we've, we've got to work together to make happen. And, uh, Ernesto tells me there's $61 million needed, so we're looking for bidders to, to, to help us get that done. Well, I actually was going to ask you how, because we, we tend to think of these large problems as the purview of very large foundations. I mean, yeah. it, what that means is you guys. Right? And so the real question is, 
what is the opportunity for people in this room, for folks who head up their own family foundations? Um, are there partnership opportunities, for example, in those two disease-specific areas or in other areas that come to mind? Two thoughts on this. One is I think all of the folks in this room have learned that the key thing that leads to successful philanthropy is to focus, to really understand what your core competencies are and to make sure that you focus in on them. So at the Gates Foundation, though, we appear large, we're actually very small relative to the overall problem. So in reality, it takes great partnership of folks in this room uh, uh, and other interested philanthropists, uh, the public health systems of the governments in the developing world, uh, the NIH, you know, CDC, you know, it, it, the, the amount of resource, whether it's financial or human, in order to make these things happen is really quite significant. And so what we try and do is we try and focus in on the things that we do best. Uh, for example, working with great organizations on the R&D that can produce an innovation like the meningitis A vaccine. And then we like to work with other organizations that will carry on with their, their expertise. And so there's a real opportunity for people in this room to come together around uh, the opportunities to reduce the burden of meningitis A or to achieve guinea worm uh, eradication. Uh, you can vaccinate, one of the beauties of the meningi meningitis A vaccine, vaccine is, is it, it's only a dollar or a dollar fifty. It's right in that range in order to have the vaccine and, and, and protect somebody for life. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that means that, you know, if we can, we can work together to to you know, have that kind of funding and get that to be a part of the ongoing uh, expanded program for Im immunization in these countries that are subject to meningitis A for a very small amount of, of resource relative to the, the, the overall problem, we can, we can uh, lead to a great success. Mm -hmm. Now I'm just gonna remind you all to write your questions and if you, just hand them up to members of staff. Um, I'm actually gonna ask the forbearance of National Public Radio um, since, if, since Gru Brundtland is here, Gru, if you have a question, given that you used to be head of the World Health Organization, we make an exception for you and you get a microphone. So just raise your hand if you, if you have a question you wanna ask. Um, I wanted to just go back and just mention that of course, we, you know, we're looking at different turning point regions. And one of those is, is sort of the Afghanistan and her, and her neighbor, Pakistan. And those are two countries where polio still exists. I, mean, I, yeah. think, you, I think you've got five countries you focus on. Um, and so you know, as, as you go to your sessions on those places, think about the health consequences in those places. The other thing, Jeff, I think you pointed out, there's, there's it, you know, if I could just add to yeah. that, there's been a 90% reduction in the last uh, year or so in polio cases in India and Nigeria. Yeah. That's yeah. huge success. In Pakistan, there's been a slight increase. And in Afghanistan, it's relatively flat to up. And it does show that, uh, but we won't succeed unless we uh, achieve elimination in all four of those, those, those countries. Yeah, the, I mean, I th the, the other thing to, to kind of bear in mind is, what is Jeff, Jeff pointing out the impact of conflict on the delivery of healthcare or any kind of prevention. And as you, as you go through sessions talking about countries that are in conflict, think about uh, the health consequences and also the fact that the health infrastructure gets gets wiped out. Right. And so that's Or the a flooding huge... in Pakistan too was a big issue. Yeah. Because yeah. basically that meant you, you know the health workers couldn't get to the kids uh, to do the vaccination. It meant that it, it turns out the way that polio again you've just eaten so I won't go through a lot of details, but polio is an oral fecal virus and so when you have flooding and, and those kinds of, uh, of problems. So Pakistan has been a mess uh, for polio, not just because of conflict, but because of natural disaster right. as well. Now, you've been, the, the Gates Foundation has been a real leader in the world of evaluations, what we call m and &E, measurement and evaluation. Um, say something about your approach at Gates, uh, and, and I mean, I know that the folks in this room like to kind of piggyback on the knowledge you're generating, so mm -hmm. like to hear about your approach. Well, I, I do, do want to uh, say that I think the sector as a whole uh, has a lot to learn about measurement and evaluation, and I want to put us right at the top of the list of, of, of needing to learn. Uh, this is not something that's easy. Uh, many of us come from the private sector, uh, or our, our wealth came from, from the private sector, and so we're used to 
having the market system as a way to provide feedback. And the beauty of the market system is that it, uh, for most products and services, provides a continuous feedback loop that really drives you to uh, uh, want to continuously improve. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you go out of business. Mm -hmm. And so the reason why this is so important is because uh, we need to make sure uh, uh, that in these big problems that we're taking on that we're continuously learning. And so the first step is to understand that philosophically, this is fundamental to great philanthropy. It's fundamental to be able to have the impact. So you essentially have to create feedback loops that will drive you to continuous uh, improvement uh, in the absence of a market system that, that helps to do that. And that's part of what really makes it tricky is that uh, you have to come up with proxies for that kind of market uh, feedback in order to really drive your work and drive improvement. And so there are things that I borrowed from my past experience in, in high tech, in the private sector, in terms of how we do strategy development and, and how we do annual reviews against uh, uh, execution. And then there's some things that I think we have to invent, that we have to do in new and different ways. And I, my own opinion at this point, you know, I'm two and a half years in uh, to this role, is, that, is my opinion at this point in time is, is that, that uh, our sector as a whole, including us, is really at, just at the very beginning of doing great work on, on measurement and evaluation. Now, we, I was going to ask you about what is your attitude toward failure, but I also have a questioner from the audience asking, what is the Gates Foundation's attitude toward risk? Yeah, I think this is a super important issue, so I appreciate uh, the question. One of the things that's really struck me about my move from the private sector into philanthropy is the challenge of making sure that we encourage uh, smart, smart risk taking. Uh, many of us grew up in, in businesses where we were expected to take risk. Uh, uh, you know, it was almost as though if you, you know, the biggest risk that we could, or the biggest mistake we would ever make is to not many, make any mistakes at all. That was a philosophy that we had at Microsoft because we knew that we were doing things that hadn't been done before. And so the only way we were going to succeed is to get out there and do them and learn from them. What I have found in philanthropy, is, especially when you get down into the organization, is a great deal of caution. You know, people get worried, you know, am I doing the right thing? But actually, that is a great paradox. It's exactly the opposite of what you want. The purpose of great philanthropy should be to be willing to take risk on behalf of society, to try and develop those innovative interventions that really can make a, a big difference, because most people don't want the government taking a lot of risk with their tax dollars. And in the private sector, another leg of the three-legged stool, I like to say, the private sector will take risk, but they'll do it for the profit motive, which is great, but we're trying to serve people where there's not a market opportunity, so the profit motive doesn't work. So if you think about that three-legged stool, you know, really the, the sweet spot for catalytic philanthropy should be to be that willingness to take risk on behalf of society where the private sector won't do it and the public sector won't do it, and then prove the success of those interventions, the evidence to support it so that they can be scaled up and sustained. So I like to say that the biggest uh, mistake that we would make, or the only failure, is not that our grants, or let me say it this way, our grants may not succeed or may not fully succeed, but our failure will be if we don't learn from those uh, experiences. That's failure. Failure is not that the grant didn't go well or that the, um, you know, the, that's, with, you know, the, the grant didn't succeed. Failure is if you don't learn. And I think if, if I can help us create a culture where that is the view that our, our program officers and program directors take, then I, I'll feel more confident that we'll get that right balance of smart risk taking. Well, you referred to caution being, being a natural instinct. So I've got two question cards. Um, one, one asks, um, whether the culture of the Gates Foundation is one of questioning and of curiosity, and the other one asked, is it as scary as we hear to, bu to brief Bill Gates? 
Well, I'm coming up on, uh, I guess it was November of 1981 when I joined Microsoft, so I'm almost on my 30th anniversary of briefings. So I've got a little history there. On, on the first question, actually, what was the first question? <laughs> <laughs> It, it related to, is there a culture of questioning and of curiosity? It, not, there is, but not as much as I would like it to be. Uh, you know, I, uh, in fact, uh, oh, about nine months into my tenure at the Gates Foundation, I uh, sort of assembled all of the things that I was learning from our employees, from our survey, from, you know, small group meetings, one-on-ones, and for percep perceptions outside the organization. And I wrote up a list of four cultural priorities that I thought we needed to deliver on. And one of the, the four is intellectual dialogue. Mm -hmm. you know, I have a, 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 you can call it an empirical principle. I think the greater the, the challenge, the bigger the, the problem you're trying to solve, the, the more likely the solutions are ambiguous. Now, why do I say that? Well, because if the, the problem is really big and is yet to be solved, uh, people probably haven't figured out the solution. But if, it, if it's a small problem uh, and the solution is obvious, then OK, it's already done. And so we'll tend to take on big problems. The solutions are ambiguous. The more ambiguous the solution, the more you need great intellectual dialogue, the more that you need a broad diversity uh, of opinion. And I do think that. Uh, one of the things that we have to be excellent at at the Gates Foundation, and we certainly can be a lot better than we are today, is to make sure that we have rigorous intellectual dialogue inside the foundation as well as with our, with our uh, grantees and uh, other thought partners outside the foundation. And I think that's one thing I'd like to see us improve on. And Here's some questions that were clearly prompted by an earlier session on uh, agricultural, uh, sustain sustainable agriculture. Um, this questioner asks, um, the, says, the world may need to double food production as populations grow in, and, in India and China and as living standards rise. And this questioner asks whether you believe that Africa can, can move to a situation in which it not only can meet its own uh, agricultural needs, food needs, but can help meet that demand in the rest of the world. I do believe that, uh, but I think it's going to take uh, I think it's going to take a lot of great collective work uh, to achieve that. Um, you know, and and of course, it has to be done in a way that's sustainable for the long term. And so I think that uh, uh, you know it's going to require a range of science and technology have better have better inputs. It's going to require great farm management practices in terms of of soil fertility and you know high productivity uh, uh, approach is going to take market access. It's going to take the right policy support. So you know we're very fortunate to work with uh, Namunga and, and the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa as an example of one organization, the African Agricultural Technology uh, Foundation. Um, it's going to take a, a lot of, of great work in order to, to achieve the goal. But we, we, have to, we have to collectively take it on and make it happen. Mm -hmm. Because there's no question that the population by the year 2050 will be in the range of 9 billion. You know, we might be able to slow population growth beyond that, but you can't really, I mean, these, there's a lag effect when it comes to population growth. And so, uh, the questioner was dead on in terms of their prediction. The world needs to double uh, food production in order to be able to, to feed the population in 2050. And so, you know, one of my big interests, personal interests, is water for food. Mm -hmm. I, you know, 70% of human consumption of, of water actually is via agriculture. And only about 10 to 15% is via domestic consumption, and the balance is, is industrial consumption. So I'm very concerned that in a world of climate change where we're going to see significant redistribution of, uh, of water, it's going to put a lot of stress on agriculture and our ability to, to feed the world. And unfortunately, a lot of those stresses on water for food are going to be in the areas like sub-Saharan Africa, which uh, are, are potentially going to be at greatest risk. And so I just point that out as, as an example of, 
of an one area that I think is going to require a lot of clever approaches, all the way from uh, crop uh, crop varieties that are more efficient in water usage to policies that better manage water usage to engineering that better facilitates uh, use of water for agriculture. So, you know, that's just a good example of how much work there's going to be to do to, to take on that challenge. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the issues you work on are, are in interrelated. Health, nutrition, uh, you mentioned water, economic development. How do your teams collaborate and sort of share knowledge across teams? Well, again, this is an, an area where I think we, we, we do some very good things, but that we can do even better. Uh, I think, you know, we've had some good dialogue in the last year between our agriculture team and our nutrition team. Uh, you know, we have good dialogue between our water sanitation and hygiene team and our uh, enteric and diarrheal diseases team. The, the connection between, you know, clean water and diarrhea. Uh, is huge and clean water relates to whether you have good sanitation. So, uh, but like with most organizations of size, and you know, we have over 900 employees, you can end up with these silos where you don't get people talking with each yeah. other. And so I think part of my responsibility as the CEO is to help us do an even better job of facilitating those type of discussions. One of my theories is that the more that I can figure out how to get us to understand the ultimate delivery of the interventions, uh, the more likely I will encourage those connections. Why? Because they, you know, that mom who's trying to, to, to feed her kids, who's also doing the, the farm labor, uh, you know, she's, that's one integrated system. And we need to think about the integrated system. Yeah. The, um, I have two cards that, that really kind of relate to the current budget battle in Washington. Um, one, one asks about the Feed the Future uh, campaign or, or program, which is a, a high priority for, for uh, mm -hmm. the Obama administration, and, and for, in fact, all the, you know, the G20 and the G8 uh, are all mobilizing resources for this. Um, are you at all worried that this will end up being on the chopping block when it comes to budget cutting? Uh, and is there a role for foundations in that? And then the other question card uh, relates to reproductive health um, and uh, asks what kind, of, uh, what kind of future you see for that. Yeah. Okay, so on, on Feed the Future, uh, the, 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 to the question of are we worried, the answer is absolutely yes. Now, let me start back on, on an even more fundamental point. The average American citizen thinks that foreign assistance is a huge percentage of the federal budget. You know, if you poll people, they'll say, oh, that's five and, you know, 10%. And then furthermore, they're, they're, they're and, and by the way, the number is 1% or less. So uh, let's be clear. What let's you can do is declare a victory and say, we'll cut it down to eight. Would you agree? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're going we're gonna to add her to our advocacy team. Uh, so yeah, that's a you know that's that's a real challenge is that perception. And furthermore, there's a, a somewhat um, well, I'm not quite sure how to say it parochial view that you know spend the money at home, you know don't care uh, about you know why should we be spending money on those kids in Africa who are dying of diarrhea, pneumonia, you know, so on and so forth. So you really you know have a challenge when we have uh, a federal budget that's. Uh, heavily based on entitlement uh, programs that are, uh, uh, well, theoretically uh, untouchable, although apparently some people want to touch them now. And then you've got the, the amount of our uh, federal budget that is quote unquote discretionary, and then you have this perception about foreign assistance. Um, so those things are on the, the chopping block, and that's very scary. Uh, for us. It's very scary, not just for Feed the Future, but also for the global health initiatives. I mean, let me just point out to everybody here in the audience that, uh, and as Bill said in the annual letter, uh, one of the most effective, if not the most effective, uh, uh, expenditures you can make in global health is vaccinating children. You can save a life for, you know, uh, less than $2,000. Another way to say it is, is that for every $2,000 you want to cut out of foreign assistance, 
in vaccines, you kill a kid. For every $2,000 you want to cut, there will be a child who dies. And, and so it's a challenging situation, uh, and as I say, a, a worrisome or scary situation for us and the others who are invested in global health to think about the consequences of what goes on in what we like to call the other Washington. Being from Seattle, we, you know, the other Washington. Have a little bit of a chip yeah. on your shoulder about uh, that. And, and so, yeah, it's a tough time. In agriculture, it, it, it's, I think it, it can be an even tougher proposition because I can point out the miracle of vaccines and it's immediately tangible, but it's tougher to point out the miracle of improved seeds and better farm management practices, but it's fundamental to people being able to feed themselves. And when people are able to feed themselves, then their kids can go to school, they have better uh, quality of life and society. And just as a reminder, the, the, the world collectively decided circa early 1980s that the first green revolution had solved the problem, cut way back on agricultural development uh, spending for the developing world so that by 2005 we saw what a crisis we had in terms of agricultural productivity to feed the world. And then people said, oh, oh wow, we, we must have made a mistake here. So since 2005, we'll, with help from, from folks at the Gates Foundation and others, we've turned a corner and agricultural development investment started to go up so that we can now get back to, a, to where we're really thinking about what we can do to improve agricultural productivity to help smallholder farmers feed themselves and feed their, their, the, the people of their, their countries. Unfortunately, now that's at risk. You know, the, uh, uh, the Muskoka G20 um, or G8 uh, commitment was, I think, $22 billion in agricultural development over a three-year period of time. Those G8 countries aren't living up to their commitment. They will fail on meeting their pledges. The only shining star is the UK, where the UK government has decided to keep their commitment to grow foreign assistance and get it to 0.7% uh, of, of GDP. And so, yeah, yeah, we're worried. Well, Gru, I want you to know if, if you want to say your blessings or point out that Norway is, is pretty darn good on this subject. Norway is, is very good. A microphone is coming your way. Well, I was wondering a little about the numbers you're using. Uh-oh. Uh <laughs> about the numbers on ODA. Because uh, the Norwegian number is close to 1%. Yes. And it's the highest among maybe uh, In percentage, the that's correct. Yeah. But, and the U.S. number is much lower than 1%, of course. It is. It's 0.15 or maybe something around that. Uh, so when people believe 5 or 10, it's not even, I mean, it's far below 1. No, I said 1% yeah. of the federal budget, and you're oh, using the percentage using of the, GDP. Yeah, I understand. But both, both of them are important numbers. Are relevant so, ones. Yeah. Okay. No, but I think that the, your point here is that the U.K. government has decided to keep its commitments and even increase them That's in correct. the coming years. Uh, uh, understanding the importance of these global issues, how they uh, affect the world at large. So I think this is it's in a conservative government in, in Britain, which has agreed with a former government on this kind of policy, which is very good. And more of this should happen here, of course. Uh, so you have someone else to add to your advocacy team. Exactly, Jeff. great. So, Please join me in thanking Jeff Rakes. Thank you. Thank you.